All right. Hello. Welcome to day 215, 365 days towards racial change. My name is Thomas Nyback, and we're here talking about black issues in America, how black people are getting along. Um, we're at the end of July 2019, and we're black folks are experiencing, oh, racial comments, racism from the leader of the free world. And uh, it's a precarious time, a slippery slope, because these um, apparently benign beginnings, uh, laughable, comments and insinuations and stuff like that are the same um, precursors that led up to the Jewish Holocaust. <laughs> and we've got to be very careful and be mindful of what we're listening to. We're seeing the, the nation just regressing, regressing. Week by week, we regress more and more. All right? well, I'm not going to waste my time here on my project because it's obvious. You see politicians posturing and uh, acting like their hands are tied. Get them out. What is the you know, big problem? Man, you don't have to have that big a case against me when you want to jam me up. <laughs> Shoot, I jaywalk. You know, I got somebody on my back. You know, this thing just goes on and on. So the the black mind in America. How how do we navigate that? We see people having privilege and. Um, favor, enjoying their freedom of speech and all that, you know, but we'll, you know, we, we can't even uh, dream of participating at that level. Um, you know, but we put that in the, in the context of the color line. You know, we got, we got politicians saying that the president's um, Remarks aren't racist. Well, guess what? The, the president doesn't determine that. People, victims of racism, determine that. J just as much as uh, victims and survivors of sexual abuse, sexual assault, determine whether they've been sexually abused or assaulted. You know, not the perpetrator. <laughs> you know? Don't put a fox in the hen house and take the testimony of the fox. You take the testimony of the hens. They're the victims. They know what happened, you know. Uh, so I say yes. There's racist comments coming out from the leader of the free world. I determine that. Your position your orientation racially in America is going to have to uh, determine that, have those solid, firm arguments of why it, it is or is not racism. Uh, and conversely, uh, the white mind, flip side of the same coin, um, how does the white mind get on now that, you know, Oh, the floodgates are now open towards open racism. You know, overt uh, racism, directed, calculated. And uh, how do we, how does the, the white mind of privilege, does it, does it sh shake it off, shrug it off, go into denial, uh, feel a sense of more freedom? You know, 
what does the white mind in America think about our recent developments racially coming coming at us almost daily now on our on our news broadcasts I watch a lot of CNN so they they don't like the president at all <laughs> so uh, we, we, they show us all the negativity about the president the white mind privilege favor expectation you know ease of moving in and out uh, of economics and, and social circles. Um, I'm impressed. I wonder what it's like. <laughs> and financial literacy, of course. That's how things get done. That's how you move things in America by being financial literate, financially literate, literate, and uh, hopefully your financial literacy gives you. Uh, some uh, empowerment, some ways to be and do better financially in America. There's an assignment against your wallet, against your uh, financial prosperity. But financial literacy can help guard against uh, these attacks, these taxes. You know, if you understand. Oh, you know, just just a few terms, uh, and the way money is working in this nation and around the globe. Uh, I'm inspired to do this project by a man named Dr. Claude Anderson of Red Three of His Works. He's easy to find on YouTube. Got plenty of material out there. He has, has an impressive resume as well. Uh, Black History Reader, 101 questions you never thought to ask. Black Labor, White Wealth, Search for Power and Economic Justice, and Dr. Anderson's National Plan to Empower Black America, Poweronomics. You can find Dr. Anderson at poweronomics.com. Behind me, you'll see the hashtag us two symbol, black women coming together, supporting one another. You can check out a place called Black Enough here, on here online, B L A G G E N U F. <laughs> and find groups and support there. If you can't find your flavor or your voice here on the web, then uh, do what I did, start your own project and see where you might go with that. Uh, we are in our extended uh, time in Uncle Tom's Cabin story time. Harriet Beecher Stowe's phenomenal work, fictional account, of slave life in America and, and the, the slave institution. And so we would use that to have some talking points about history, social structure, uh, everything uh, is touched on. We're into a pretty long section on spirituality and we're focused on a little blonde white girl, her relationship with Uncle Tom and uh, how she's impacting the lives of those around her. She's extremely mature, spiritual. So uh, we are continuing. Uh, it's a chapter uh, 26, Death. And this is part two. Uh, yesterday, we talked about uh, Eva was supposed to give away some of her blonde curls. And she, she wants to do as she expects her time. She expects her time is short. She wants to do this personally and uh, be the hand to give this very personal gift. Probably her pride, what would be her pride? We don't get pride from Eva, but these curls are, would be her pride you know, in life, you know, blonde curls. Even her father is covetous of those blonde curls, and he doesn't want to see them cut off, but he submits to the will of Eva. Uh, and now St. Clair's like, look, don't don't mess with your hair too much because we want to take you to see your cousin Enrique. And she's like, I'm not going to see Enrique. And we were wondering uh, why was she so adamant about not seeing Enrique? Is she disturbed by Enrique's um, behavior? And 
that may be the truth, but now we find out as we've read, as we go a little further into the chapter part two here, we find uh, we're glad she doesn't want to go see Henrique. I hope you're glad she doesn't want to see him because he's a brute, spoiled brute. Treats black people as objects, you know, uh, and he abuses them. So we're, we're glad she doesn't want to go and will not go, but she's not going to go because um, her time is short. She says there there's no time to even go visit. I don't know. I don't. I don't, I don't get a sense of how far away. Alfred's plantation is, but uh, Eva's like, you know, and there's not enough time to go travel. The, the time is, is getting away from us, it's urgent that I uh, take these few more steps in my mission here on earth, and uh, you know, now the next step is to give these curls see my friends and the people I love. Um, we find her there's still some tension occurring between her and St. Clair. She, uh, she's really chipping away at her father's denial that she's passing, that she could say this about herself, uh, to say, to say and be unafraid that she is uh, moving in that direction toward the grave. And when we find that inverse uh, relationship, um, her spirituality is growing exponentially. She's maturing uh, in a body that's decaying and failing and uh, will soon return to the earth. Um, so that, that is Eva's uh, what's happening in Eva's life, and now that she's, um, whenever she's with anyone, uh, she's going to be in spiritual mode, uh, drawing that person higher and higher, uh, to, because she wants everyone to be in the same celestial heights as herself. Very, she's very dynamic. And Harriet Beecher Stowe is really uh, playing this aspect of Eva up. Uh, that it's important. Lives change when they come near her and, and everything. And this is happening in the midst of uh, a black holocaust at that time. You know, the slavery, you know, Prue's murder. Oh, families being torn apart. Uh, people like Enrique with uh, uh, too much power and whatnot. You know, this is all collapsed upon Eva, and it's uh, tearing her apart. Maybe uh, the very source of the illness that's got her gripped and on her way uh, heavenward. Uh, my strength is failing. The time is near. Hear some truth from me, Dad, Daddy. And St. Clair is like, man, this is still too much. Still too much. You know, In the midst of this, the curls have been cut. Ophelia did the work. And now um, Eva's ready to dispense her gift, her her. her uh, her personal bit of me memorabilia to the people she loves and care about. And, um, and people gather, uh, slaves from the house, and they're, they're not on the plantation, they're at the summer home at Lake Pontchartrain. And she's like, the, the, the whole room, there's tears and sadness, but they're hanging on every word, so she breaks the silence with saying, I'm leaving in a couple weeks, and you must, uh, if you want to see me again, you must be a Christian. And this is the, uh, 
the, the this whole section before we're going to find uh, more space after this central moment. Uh, a lot of religious spiritual talk, but th this is the only like Harriet Beecher Stowe doesn't berate us with evangelism and trying to get us saved. The, the story is not a, really about that. Um, but, you know, she's honoring Eva's convictions. This is probably Harriet Beecher Stowe's convictions as well about being saved to, to see the saved again. Those who who um, you know received Jesus uh, in some way on some level. Uh, when they go on, the theory goes that. If you want to see these people again, then you must uh, have a similar belief in this person called Jesus. And so um, he was putting that together, and she says, "You guys must be Christians to see me again." And also, it's the dimension of Harriet Beecher Stowe again is talking about this Christian nation, these people going to church, these church goers, and all this stuff dwelling in the midst, condoning uh, this horror show called slavery in America. You know, Peru's masters that beat her to death, oh, they probably they might go to church every Sunday, <laughs> you know, but fully justified in beating a person to death, separating people from their newborn infants and stuff like that. Uh, this, this is going on in the midst of this religious nation. Uh, be, be a Christian if you want to see me again. And um, uh, she, she starts going in about, you know, uh, you can learn more about the faith if you read, but then she has to catch herself. And she's like, oh, but you, you people can't read because you know, Eva's done the reading to them. Grown-ups, white grown-ups have done the reading. That's how black folks get their religion. And at, and at the reading part, Eva breaks down in front of all of them. She says, oh my goodness, you, you can't read, therefore you, you can't access uh, the reason for our belief, the reason for our faith. Uh, you are outside. You know? And I, I, I'm the, uh, I have a similar conviction about music. Um, I, I can read music. Which is interesting. I couldn't read music worth a damn coming up in grade school. I didn't understand it or whatnot. Probably because uh, I'm one of those tactile learners and too much theoretical stuff just doesn't stick, right? It, you, sh you show me an idea, you better have some examples that I can go through for it to stick. And uh, so uh, when I did get into music, I insisted on being able to read. Being able to read gives me access to the whole world of music. You know, I don't, I'm not, I don't have to hear it. I don't learn that way. There are people on the earth that can hear stuff and play it right back. Good for them. Uh, I need the written notes so I can engage. That's how I, how, that's my process. Uh, you know, the same thing uh, for reading. You know, an illiterate person, um, I'll put the Bible aside, but an illiterate person is at the mercy of those who are literate. You know, literacy, I can take any instruction off the shelf and I can access uh, wealth and power through that. You know, the, the literacy. Uh, towards black folks, black slaves in America, uh, it's it's really there's really an intentionality about it because reading gives people uh, power, it gives them confidence, knowledge. You can start asking better questions, and, you, know, you can challenge authority, things like that. You know, reading was forbidden in many areas consistently. Um, throughout the country. Um, uh, we looked at Georgia, Alabama, uh, 
I think, uh, just in so, just a few states. But I'm pretty sure every uh, state had a, a literacy law concerning blacks and what they would you could be whipped and prison and stuff like that for teaching black folks to read. Uh, they say reading made a black person uh, harder to handle. They, uh, they've got this knowledge now in their mind, and which is interesting because. You know, as far as the two states named uh, in the text, we have Kentucky up north, and yeah, they run through Ohio and stuff like that. That that's the, the escaping group. But as far as Tom's experience, Kentucky and Louisiana, you know, what we find there is we find them t- having some idea about reading. Uh, Tom can can read his Bible in, in some in a broken English kind of fashion. He struggles with the text, and so he needs it read to him as well. But we don't find any uh, barriers for Black folk reading, you know, even speaking openly about it. And uh, we want to see there's a lot we'll have more conversation around literacy. Uh, so, so I'm wondering, you know, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe is obviously making a plea to condone more literacy among black folks, uh, but, but her story is, is transparent. And so here's this point where Eve was like, the, one of the best, reason, best reasons to enable blacks to read is so that they can engage the word of God and be saved and, and, and all that uh, all that philosophy comes into play you know, blacks can access the word for themselves they don't have to hear it um, digested disseminated to them through a white mouth uh, and whatnot. Uh, it could be their first act of self-sufficiency, self-empowerment, self-determination. Um, that this is Eva's burden, concern that she that she she's burning up. She's feverish with it. Her head is hot um, with this burden. You know, it's it's a way to access knowledge and power. And she puts uh, herself away, and she says, uh, you know, puts that away, and she says, oh, Jesus will take care of that. Uh, So she's trusting that um, God is going to work it out and help uh, the black folks to learn how to read so they can you know, read about God, be saved, reunite with Eva someday. Um, at that, the curls are then distributed and passed around. Um, towards the, at the end of this section, we, we broke this chapter. It's a pretty, pretty uh, big, dense chapter. And We'll finish it off tomorrow, I think. But Ophelia moves uh, moves everyone out and uh, Topsy is left um, on the floor and um, she she wants her curl. Of course, she gets her curl, and there's more intimacy exchanged between her and Eva. Uh, now that Topsy's got her curl, she had a you know a special moment with Eva. Now she is uh, she's escorted out, and only Ophelia, Marie, and Saint Clair are left in the room. Uh, concerning these curls. Uh, Tomorrow we'll find out more how 
how this unfolds, uh, this mature preteen or deathbed uh, is educating, being a light to her white caregivers and parents and the grown-ups. She's being uh, such a light to them, um, encouraging their faith, um, correcting them, maybe on some errors and issues, and we're really, really amazed at the depth of uh, this young girl. Let's come back tomorrow, see how the chapter finishes off, uh, and what, what's behind these curls. Maybe there's some more information to be had, and uh, We'll see how Harriet Beecher Stowe is going to position uh, this narrative as Eva is uh, on her way, heavenbound, upward. <laughs> I'm Thomas Nyback. That's day 215 out of the way, 365 days towards racial change. Come back tomorrow. Let's uh, see what happens.